Okay. We started. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Today we are going to talk about airway maintenance in anesthesia and ICU practice. Uh, myself, Dr. Smithul Dave, Assistant Professor, lives in Department of Anesthesia. So, what are the objectives for today? The main purpose of this session is that the students should be able to describe the anatomy of the upper airway, explain the various types of airway exercises, describe the methods involved in placement of airway, indications, complications, and preferences. The session plan today includes the introduction, anatomy of airway, various airway devices, indications and methods of placement, complications and preferences, and mission advances. Now, what is respiration? So first, when you inhale, ventilation process takes place. The air goes into the alveoli. From where the gas exchange takes place. So then, after the exchange of the there's a perfusion to the lungs via pulmonary circulation, and then the systemic circulation takes place through which the cellular mitochondria they get the necessary product. Now, what is the airway? How do you start describing an airway? Going from top to bottom, first there is nose, which leads to nasopharynx. Next is the mouth, behind which you have oropharynx. Then next is larynx, trachea. The right and the left main bronchi, as you can see in the picture, the lobar bronchi, segmental bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. Now, under normal circumstances, when you are speaking in awake, in awake position, the soft palate is intact. So you are able to breathe and relax. Now, in the case of while you are sleeping or under anesthesia or unconsciousness, there is partial obstruction which leads to snoring. In the cases of subapnea and apnea, there is critical obstruction and total obstruction. That occurs when the soft palate or the uvula is touching the posterior pharyngeal wall. At that point, it becomes critical. So that can lead to subapnea and apnea. Now, how do you maintain your airway? There's a maneuver called triple maneuver or trophic maneuver in which you do a head tilt, chin dip, and a jaw thrust. This process will make your airway intact and you'll be able to snore. We also have devices for the same purpose. There's an oropharyngeal devices and mesopharyngeal devices. As shown in the figure, you have different sizes available for the same. Next, we have laryngeal mask airways. The laryngeal mask airways, as the name suggests, it gets settled on the larynx and it will keep the laryngeal inlet open. And the last resort is endotracheal intubation, in which you insert an endotracheal tube via laryngoscopy and keep your respiratory system intact. Next, we have tracheostomy. As you can see in the figure, we have different cartilages, thyroid cartilage, leucoid cartilage, and between the thyroid membrane. Next, we move on to the tracheal rings. Between the second and the third tracheal cartilage is the usual site for tracheostomy, where we put in a device used for tracheostomy as shown in the figure next week. Now, what are the indications and preferences? When you maintain, when you want to maintain your airway for a shorter duration, you use oropharyngeal airway, nasopharyngeal airway, laryngeal mask airway, and manually by the maneuver which was shown before, which included head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. Airway maintenance and protection we carry out when there is a risk for aspirations. So, in those circumstances, we use endotracheal tubes, which are cuffed, which you can put in to orally or mutually. And the second option is tracheostomy, which is we have cuffed tracheostomy tubes. Now, coming to the basic endotracheal tube, what are the parts of an endotracheal tube? So, you have a connector, you have a pilot tubing with a balloon, you have, there is a mushroom end, and there is a patient end. At the patient end, you have a morphine eye located on the lateral wall. A bevel, 
located at an angle and a cup. How do you do an endocritical intubation? Now, the position of the patient is very important when you're planning to do an endocritical intubation. So, the axis, you should have the laryngeal axis and the pharyngeal axis along with the oral axis in one line. When the neck is flexed and the extension of the head is done, you get a proper position of the patient for carrying out laryngoscopy and inserting an endocritical tube. Now, what do you see while you are doing an endocritical intubation? After doing a proper laryngoscopy, this is the picture you will observe in situ of the patient's bladder. The two white structures that you can see on the figure on the right hand side, those are the vocal cords, beyond which you need to put your endocritical tube. Now, while doing a direct laryngoscopy, you see the following structures. The base of the tongue, as you can see, is told to relate with the structure seen inside the figure on the center and the one which you can see on the left hand side. So then there is a base of the tongue, you have an epiglottis. The white shining structures you can see, those are the vocal cords, beyond which you have the laryngeal inlet, and posteriorly there are adrenoid cartilages. Now there are two maneuvers which are helpful in doing the endocritical intubation in case of difficulty or under certain circumstances. Now to improve the laryngoscopy view, we usually what the maneuver used is first, which means backwards, upwards, and rightwards. We need to push the patient's thyroid cartilage backwards, upwards, and rightwards to improve the laryngoscopic view. The other maneuver is Felix maneuver in which we carry out some pressure over the cricoid against the vertebra. This would lead to compression of the esophagus and which would prevent the aspiration of gastric content entering into the pharynx. We carry out the endotracheal intubation by a cellic maneuver in cases of pregnancy and the, when the patient had already been used. Now we have different sizes of endotracheal tubes starting from 2.5 mm which depends on the external diameter, that is outer diameter, leading till 10. We even have cuffed endotracheal tubes and non-cuffed endotracheal tubes. There are PVC, that is polygonal chloride tubes, special curvature tubes, electrometallic tubes. In children up to 8 years, we prefer uncuffed tubes because in children, the subglottic or the subglottic portion is a narrowest portion. So, in such case scenarios, in the children up to 8 years, we prefer to use the uncuffed endocritical tube. As you can see, the infantile larynx and the adult larynx, they have different physical structures. The infantile larynx is bone shaped, whereas the adult larynx is cylindrical in shape. That is the reason the infants have the sub portion as the narrowest portion, but in the adult, the, the glottic portion that is the area where you can see your vocal cords, that is the narrow space. Now, once you have intubated the patient, what are the confirmatory signs? First, see the tube, whether you have inserted the tube via the laryngeal index, under which you want to attach the circuit to the ventilator, ventilate the patient, and look at the chest for the bilateral equal movement. To ventilate and auscultate, Next thing is, you need to see the moisture in the expired air over the endotracheal tube. And the most confirmatory sign is the tubing monitoring, that is capnography. This will confirm that your endotracheal tube is in situ into the trachea. Now, what are the other chances of dislodgement? Either your endotracheal tube is two in size, that is, it has one to one of the bronchi. This can lead to one lobe collapse. And the other is you are out of the vocal cord, and this distortion will lead to removal of the endocritical tube. Next is talking about the cuff. What is the importance of the cuff in the endocritical intubation? It will hold the endocritical tube in position 
after you inflate the cup, what the endotracheal tube has bypassed the vocal cord. At that point, to inflate the cup, this will keep the endotracheal tube in position. Check whether there is any air leak or no air leak. If there is no air leak, it is good because it will keep your airway protected from vomitus, blood, or regurgitation. We have two kinds of cups. There, there are low volume, high pressure cups, and there are high volume, low pressure cups. We prefer high volume, low pressure cups since having high pressure cups will lead to ischemia, ulceration, and erosion of the trachea. Which will lead to healing with contracture and ultimately leading to stenosis of the lab. So, what we prefer is high volume, low pressure cups. Now, when do we need to have caution? In cases when the patient has loose teeth or dentures, in coagulation disorders, when you have restricted mouth opening, restricted head extension, cervical spine fractures, in such case scenarios, you need to be more cautious. Now, when do you carry out the process of intubation? First, you need to give an proper, adequate anesthesia to the patient, which includes paralyzing the patient as well. Whether the patient is unconscious or semi-conscious, you need to check for that also. In case, when the patient is awake and you are going to carry out a certain procedure, you need to anesthetize the upper airway via fiber optic endoscope. The next is, what are the indications for tracheal intubation? Anesthetic surgery. So in anesthesia for various surgeries, when you need to have airway protection in cases of incomplete fasting time, or when there is blood or vomitus in the pharynx. Securing the airway in the cases of burns or other airway obstruction. For ventilatory therapy, giving intermittent positive pressure ventilation in case of cardiopulmonary resuscitation or respiratory failure. When the patient is unconscious or semi-conscious, as the patient needs his airway to be maintained properly, and elective ventilation in cases of cardiac or neurosurgery. Now, what are the indications for nasopracheal intubation? In cases of oral cavity surgery, long-term ventilatory therapy, we need to carry out nasopracheal intubation. What are the advantages of nasopracheal intubation? You get the seal clear. There is stable move, there is stability of the tube, there is less movement of the tube. And what are the disadvantages? Is while you are inserting it through the nasa, nasal cavity, there, is, there might be injury to the terminates and infection. Coming to laryngeal mask airways. Now, what is a laryngeal mask airway? As the name suggests, the laryngeal mask is going to lay over the laryngeal index. That is, in which it comes in between the oral or the nasopharyngeal airway and the endotracheal tube and it covers the laryngeal inlet. The laryngeal mask airways are sized from number one till number five. It is technically easy to put, even with the train muscles at the trauma field. And when is it used? So it is used in case of train intubations. We can use second generation laryngeal mask airways that is ICHAR. Now, Secondly, certain procedures which can be carried out through LMA, fiber optic endoscopy is one of them. Now, which are the different, different types of LMA? You have regular LMAs, high gel, pro seal LMAs, flexometallic LMA, and intubating LMA. Now, in cases of difficult intubation, how do you how do you come to know whether there is a difficult intubation? You first must ventilate the patient, then you carry out laryngoscopy, and then you carry out intubation in case of normal patient. When it is difficult to carry out intubation, you go for laryngeal mask airways. Even when there is a difficulty in putting the laryngeal mask airways, next is you carry out mask ventilation. You try to maintain the patient over mask ventilation. But when that is also difficult, we need to go out and secure the airway via brachiostomy or glucothyrotomy. Now, what are the kinds of surgical airways? There's brachiostomy in which you make an opening 
into the tracheal wall and insert the tracheal from it and maintain the ventilation. Or we can even carry out the thing by percutaneous dilatation of the tracheostomy. Now, what are the differences between intubation and tracheostomy? Comparing the two, intubation will provide reliable airway in cases of emergency and subglottic stenosis. When we are going to carry out tracheostomy, the advantages are it avoids direct injury to the larynx, there will be better nursing care and function, better patient mobility, more secure airway, it permits speech, and there is psychological benefit to the patient. Now, what are the indications? In cases of airway obstruction, like infection, peptidic infections, through to weak angina, laryngeal tumor, and trauma, and electively, when there is anticipated prolonged ventilatory therapy, in cases of urgent intubation, to carry out tracheostomy, and for anesthesia for laryngectomy in cases of carcinoma larynx. Now, what are the complications of tracheostomy? Most com common complication is bleeding. Causative emphysema or pneumothorax, good infection, that is, it can lead to tracheal cutaneous fistula, secondary tracheal innominate artery fistula, tracheal stenosis, and tube related complications like dislodgement of the tube or block by secretion. What is needle trichothyrotomy? In cases of emergency, we can secure the airway by needle trichothyrotomy via a special needle use. It is nothing but a white bore IV cannula. It can be carried out in patients more than 12 years of age. So to summarize everything, what did we learn? What we have to keep in mind, the general anesthesia techniques and agents, they suppress or interfere with all resistance. The eternal vigilance that is monitoring is the price of safety. The recovery depends on the type of anesthesia and the agents used, and the preventive measures and appropriate management of complications is essential for safe conduct. We have carried out the entire lecture using these two books. Thank you. Thank you.